Heavenly Father, we thank you as always, even uh, at this time where we cannot gather in person to be able to gather together via the computer uh, and uh, study your word uh, and deliver your truths. Be with us tonight as we uh, talk about um, uh, talk about various articles within the apology, uh, specifically that of the political order, uh, and help us to come to a greater understanding of these things so that uh, it may edify our faith and bring us closer to you. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Wow. Really, guys? Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> right in the middle of the prayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's my luck. <laughs> you know, and, you know and, and since we've been, you know, behind closed doors, yeah. the doorbell hard, hardly rings anymore. Right. Who, right. who was that? Why did one of our grass mode? Okay, so somebody somebody mowed our grass earlier today. Yeah. And then there was a different service next door mowing the guy next door and obviously didn't see our fresh cut grass and decides to ring our doorbell and ask if we need hey. lawn, lawn service. Like, tis can, what it is. <laughs> wow. No sweat. Uh, believe me, all in right. a house with six kids plus a dog, there's yeah. noise all the time. Um, <laughs> and uh, especially right now in the open church with no one else in there but my family, uh, Trish and the kids sit in the cry room because the, the little one has found his voice. Uh, and yeah. he likes to screech very high. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So we're beginning tonight with uh, Article 16 on political order. And um, this really is kind of an extended discourse that Melanchthon is going to give us on what what has come to be known in, in kind of Lutheran theological terms as the doctrine of the two kingdoms. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this... Uh, is a doctrine is I think this is really important for us right now uh, because this is a doctrine that uh, gets um, accused of essentially starting the separation of church and state. Um, now we've taken that to mean that the church and, and state are so far separate and nothing has to do with the other. That's what we've done in our American context. And that is right. not what Luther does in any way, shape, or form. And we're going to see tonight in, in this discussion that this isn't what Melanchthon is doing either. Um, and so we'll see uh, through this why the, the doctrine of the two kingdoms was important, why it came about um, as a lot of things in terms of, of development of doctrine. Uh, a lot of things come about due to what we call polemics, uh, polemical situations. As doctrine is argued about, you have to, through that, that arguing and driving each other back to scripture, that's kind of where these uh, benchmarks or um, fence posts get placed that kind of set the boundaries uh, of, of what is right doctrine and, and what isn't. Uh, or what we talked about before, what we call heterodox and orthodox. And so yeah. this, uh, so we'll kind of see where those those uh, fence posts get laid here uh, in this political order. So he starts off, Melanchthon does, by saying that um, they receive this doctrine without any exception. And so as Melanchthon is wont to do, instead of just saying, hey, great, now let's move on, uh, he has to unpack and so he begins to unpack, and he does so um, first uh, in paragraph 54 by saying this entire topic concerning the distinction between the kingdom of Christ and a political kingdom has been explained to advantage to the remarkably great consolation of many consciences in the literature of our writers, namely that the kingdom of Christ is spiritual inasmuch as Christ governs by the word and by preaching. So there's the first kingdom, right? We have the, the spiritual kingdom governed by Christ through his word. And then we have the legitimate political ordinances of every nation. Um, now, we have to, to, to bear in mind that both of these come from God. God rules both kingdoms. It's not like there's some secular kingdom that has nothing to do with God and some church kingdom that has only to do with God. These two kingdoms are under God. So God rules his church through his word 
and the rest of the world through the power of the sword through secular rulers. That's how the two kingdoms uh, doctrine goes. And um, the, the source of all power and authority comes from the only one that's got true power and authority over anything, God. And so what Melanchthon then seeks to kind of outline here is uh, these very, he, he almost takes the lens of uh, a proper division of law and gospel and applies them to this, this doctrine of the two kingdoms. Uh, and he, he kind of goes through some of the church fathers and talks about how they talk of these things. But really kind of the point that I want to get to uh, is it's in 59. He says, uh, the gospel forbids private redress in order that no one should interfere with the office of the magistrate. Uh, so what he's saying, is he's talking about vengeance, right? Um, so if someone wrongs us, it is not, it's not up to us to take revenge. Uh, and if we do that as private individual citizens, we are actually mucking up the process. Uh, God has given the power to execute his justice through magistrates. And when we take our own revenge, uh, it, it causes further issue. And it, I mean, if you think about that, right? So if, um, if someone, uh, for example, if someone uh, is involved in a DUI, uh, hit and run and, and kills somebody, and then it comes out and that person's family who was killed goes and takes the life of the other person. Now you're just adding into this whole mess of what the secular rulers have to deal with. And so I thought that was really, really telling that uh, Melanchthon is going to move into things like, like revenge or, or vengeance. Um, that private re redress is what he calls it, uh, using this terminology, um, is not advised against, but it's actually prohibited by Matthew 5, by Romans mm -hmm. 12. And then he sets this right. up to talk about what he what he calls public redress made through the office of the magistrate, uh, not advised against, but actually commanded for them to do it, uh, to mm -hmm. actually to actually do those things. And then he gives a list at, of what uh, secular rulers are by virtue of what God has given them to do, what they are allowed to do in accordance with Scripture. Uh, he says legal decisions, so running an actual court system um, mm -hmm. and, and abiding by those. Capital punishment. Melanchthon says it right here. There's a lot of uh, Christians that have issue with, with capital punishment, even though it is throughout all of Scripture um, uh, actually given by God to, to execute capital punishment. Uh, wars, military service. So those are the big ones that he actually um, names off. And what Melanchthon is really trying to combat here is this notion that, that Christians cannot be part of any of that process. That there's such a, a fine, or not a fine, but a hard distinction between the left and the right hand kingdom. That, that Christians can't hold office, that Christians shouldn't be soldiers, those types of things. And this comes out, Luther himself actually writes a, a, a treatise called Whether Soldiers Too Can Be Saved. Uh, and was uh, very helpful to me as I transitioned out of the military and had to go back and kind of deal with, okay, what have I done in my life? Uh, whose authority did I have to do those? And as a Christian, do I have the right to have done those, those things? Um, and reading through Luther's treatise was very helpful for me to say, yes, I had, I, I can, as a Christian, I can absolutely serve my country. I can defend those but it also was condemning in other aspects to where I would look at maybe the war that I was in not, not qualifying as a just war. Uh, and then how do you deal with, with those types of things? So a lot of this, the reason why Melanchthon is writing the way that he is, is because a lot of this has come up to, to Christians withdrawing from those things. And he's trying to, trying to correct that. Um, now, uh, Luther will say at one point, uh, in, a, in a different treatise than uh, whether soldiers too can be saved, that the, the hardest thing in the world to find is a truly Christian prince, so a truly Christian magistrate. Um, and, and so, you know, you get, you get shortly before this, this time period, 
uh, Machiavelli writing The Prince and, and things like Absolute Power Corrupts Absolutely and, and, and those types of things. Um, and the things that Machiavelli advocates at, uh, in the writing of The Prince for, for uh, a magistrate to gain and to keep power are, are not synonymous with being a Christian. Now, Luther knows this also, so does Melanchthon. Um, and yet they're going to talk about that we should have Christian princes. We desire Christian princes. Um, um, and we, uh, as a voting populace now, should desire to have people that share our worldview as Christians, um, which means that we would like Christians to be in office. Uh, we're seeing right now the difficulty when uh, a profession of mouth and a reflection of life seem to be at odds with one another uh, and the fallout which comes from that. Uh, and, and I think this is where, where um, Luther is very well taken in the fact that uh, it's difficult to remain in power and make the decisions that you have to make and still be a good, solid uh, Christian with that. And so uh, this, this difficulty uh, Melanchthon begins to wrestle with here. He also talks about uh, in 61 and following, he talks about um, uh, Christian perfection. Now, the reason why this, uh, this topic of Christian perfection comes up is remember a lot of what Melanchthon has done previously in this has, has talked about um, this idea that perfection can be attained on earth, uh, that it can be tain, attained specifically through things like monastic orders, lifestyles, withdrawing from the greater population into your own segregated, uh, secluded Christian community. Uh, mm -hmm. But this all revolves around the fact that there is a belief that uh, Christian perfection can happen in this life. And Melanchthon has tried at each time we've crossed this, this path to show that, no, we, we, we cannot uh, attain Christian perfection in this life. Um, and so he, he starts here that there's, uh, there's this notion that uh, Christians can't hold property, that they can't, uh, they can't obey certain civil ordinances. Uh, that they can't um, can't fight uh, in the military and they can't hold public office, things like that. And this is exactly what he's uh, speaking against, writing against. He says, for Christian perfection consists not in contempt of civil ordinances, but in dispositions of the heart, in great mm -hmm. fear of God, in great faith, just as Abraham, David, Daniel, uh, even in great wealth and while exercising civil power, we're no less perfect than any hermits. But the monks, especially the barefoot monks, so he's talking about uh, um, uh, cloistered monastic orders, um, yeah. uh, have spread this outward hypocrisy before the eyes of men so that it could not be seen and what things true perfection exists. So he's trying to set up this distinction between what is believed to be true per perfection, which is withdrawal from all of these things, uh, and what he believes perfection, or at least the Christian life, should look like. This shouldn't surprise us, right? When we when we read the small catechism, we talk about things, especially in the table of duties. And we have all of these duties that, that are outlined from God's word to where Christians are to act in concert with, with being in the world. Uh, we're not called to remove ourselves uh, from the world. Uh, and so this is really what Melanchthon is talking about. Even things like holding property can be for the benefit of the neighbor, um, as long as it's not done uh, with avarice, right, to, to where you're just accumulating things for your, for your own self. And so that's right. really what he's trying to, uh, trying to talk about uh, here at this point. Any questions on that so far? And we'll just kind of wrap up this section. Um, he references quite a bit that uh, that other theologians have written on this, and a lot of these, so a lot of these treatises that I'm talking about of Luther's have come up uh, leading up to this that he's published uh, to the Christian nobility, whether soldiers too can be saved. Um, those types of treatises have all come about at this time, and so you're getting a lot of discussion right now about what what kind of the the role of the Christian in the world is. Another reason that you're getting this type of discussion is, and this this in and of itself should debunk the myth of uh, hard separation of church and state. Who is Melanchthon writing to? Do you remember? 
He's, he's refuting the confutation, but he's not writing to the opponents. He's writing to the emperor. And what is he asking the oh. emperor to do? He's asking the emperor to adjudicate this division between the opponents and the Lutherans and the reformers. So he's asking a secular prince to adjudicate matters of faith and doctrine. So we, we have to keep that in mind. So much for separation of church and state, right? Right. Right. So um, and, and all is they're asking uh, really, and, and Luther brings this out well um, uh, in several of those treatises that I mentioned, that uh, the, the role of the government in matters of faith is to ensure that the pure proclamation of the gospel isn't suppressed. That's it. That's it. It's not it's not anything else other than that one function. Um, and so that's that's the underlying kind of um, situation that that is precipitating a lot of what Melanchthon's trying to write about in this in this article. Um, and he kind of he uh, he wraps this up with a, a little bit of uh, the three estates doctrine that we had talked about before, um, where he talks about here at the end the importance of these matters was greatly obscured previously by those silly monastic monastic opinions which far preferred the hypocrisy of poverty and humility to the state and the family, although these have God's command, while this platonic communion of monasticism has not God's command. So Melanchthon is speaking from the position of the church, advocating for government and family. So you have all three of the estates right there. And he's saying that, that is, those are commanded by God in God's word, whereas this removal from from the life, the worldly life, and and cloistering, cloistering yourself away doesn't have the command of God. So that's how he finishes yeah. those. Okay. Any question on that one? Nope, that's, right. that's good. Perfect. So we move into uh, Article 17, uh, Christ's Return to Judgment. This one uh, is what we would normally expect when agreement has been uh has happened. So he says, the 17th article, the adversaries receive without exception in which we confess that at the consummation of the world, Christ shall appear and shall raise up all the dead and shall give to the godly eternal life and eternal joys, but shall condemn the ungodly to be punished with the devil without end, period. One statement, that's it. Uh, so for those Lutherans that don't believe in hell, Melanchthon just kind of debunks that. Those Lutherans that, or even Christians that, that say that uh, Christ uh, in judgment will send everybody to, to heaven, this is saying not, not even remotely close. Um, that, that the biblical teaching that there is a heaven, that there is a hell, that are, there is eternal glory and eternal punishment does exist in Christ as, as the arbitrator of those, those things. Any questions on 17? Nope, nice that's and, pretty nice much and easy. the second article of the creed right that's there. That's right. You got it. Um, all right. So article 18 here is on free will. And as we would expect, um, there is a little bit of discussion. I remember when I very first read this at seminary, I assumed that there was going to be much more discussion than there was. Uh, because on free will, you had um, uh, Erasmus on the side of the Roman Catholics writing against Luther and Luther writing against Erasmus. Uh, uh, Erasmus writes the freedom of the will. Luther writes the bondage of the will. Right. So there's there's this. There's this tension between um, what the will is and and uh, what its role in salvation is and what the will can do apart from the grace of God. And a lot of this actually stems from St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine, uh, very early in his conversion, uh, still had... Um, as he was writing against the Manichaeans, the Manichaeans were, were very deterministic. Uh, the will uh, was not free. Um, and so he, uh, at early after his conversion, um, Augustine was writing against the Manichaeans and was pushing so hard against this determinism uh, that he, he over pushed the freedom of the will. 
later in his life, especially uh, so uh, Pelagius will will pick up on this and use this. He'll even cite early Augustine against himself <laughs> later in Augustine's life. That's always great when one of your writings gets cited against you. Um, but uh, later in his life, as Augustine comes uh, into contact with uh, Pelagius and his writings, um, Augustine is going to be more reserved in talking about uh, the will being completely free. Um, and so this early Gust Augustine versus late Augustine, um, and I don't, that is a very sim simplistic distinction. I don't need mean to make it that simple. It's really not the, 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 the formation uh, and the maturing of anyone's thought can't be cookie cutter laid out. Um, and right. so, uh, but, but for sake of time, without having to get into how he develops that, um, it, it is uh easiest to say that there is a distinction between his earlier and his later works. Uh, if you want to read up more uh, on that uh, in Peter Brown's biography of uh, St. Augustine, he's got uh, a chapter that, that kind of talks about this. Um, so uh, I would uh, commend that reading to you if you want to know more. Um, it's, a, it's a great biography, actually. So here, uh, Melanchthon is going to right away uh, bring up these very two things that I just talked about with St. Augustine. So he brings up the Manichaeans, right? And he brings up the Pelagians. So, um, and he does so because the Confutation brings up both of these. Uh, Luther was accused of being Manichaean by his Roman Catholic opponents. Uh, and we see this. So the, the, the Confutation says uh, the Pelagians uh, grant too much to human will. Uh, the Manichaeans deny free will at all. Remember, I said de very deterministic um, the, were the Manichaeans. Uh, and so Melanchthon says, OK, fine, I, I got it. But what difference is there between the Pelagians and our adversaries? Since both hold that without the Holy Ghost, men can love God, perform God's commandments with respect to the substance of the acts and can merit grace and justification by works, which reason performs by itself without the Holy Ghost. So while the Lutherans were being accused of being Manichaeans, deterministic, uh, the Lutherans were accusing the Roman Catholic opponents of being Pelagians, attributing too much to the human will unaided by God. Um, and so Melanchthon is going to kind of unpack this a little bit. And he's going to say uh, that the human will, unaided by God, can certainly do things in regards to civil righteousness. Uh, the human will, unaided by God, can serve the neighbor. Um, it doesn't merit anything in, in God's eyes. And this is the biggest hiccup, right? I, uh, I've heard this a lot since uh, being ordained. Uh, people coming to me and lamenting the fact that uh, they have people that they know um, that don't really believe or may live a lifestyle contrary to the word of God. And, the, and, and I, I will tell them, you know, as difficult as this is, this, you know, this is scripture says that if you don't have the faith, uh, you're going to be damned. Um, and, and then I almost inevitably get the response. But there's such there's such a good person. You know, and and Melanchthon saying, yeah, they they can be outwardly a good person. Um, they can do these civil righteousness acts. Um, uh, and even unaided can speak of God in general terms. Um, they can think that they are placating God by these outward acts, but there is no actual faith. And so because there's no actual faith, this is where we get in scripture. My works are, are appear to you as dirty rags, right? right. Um, yeah. uh, because we, without faith, uh, then Christ's righteousness isn't given to us. And so then without faith in Christ's righteousness, God only sees our sinfulness. It doesn't matter how many good works that we do, um, that, that since that sin has not been atoned for, it remains with us. It, be, it is imputed uh, apart from Christ. And so it doesn't matter how many good works that we do. Um, we can do all the outward works that we want to. Um, and, and Melanchthon says even civil righteousness can restrain the hand of the murderer uh, can restrain people from committing adultery, from theft. So this um, this desire, and I think Jesus and the rich young man 
uh, highlights this very, very well, right? The rich young man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what, what must I do to be saved? And, and Jesus, you know, tells him, you know, about the commandments. And he says, all of these I've kept from my youth. And then Jesus says, what? Sell all you have and give your money to the poor and then come follow me. And it wasn't about selling all that he had. The fact of the matter was that his own riches were the thing that he had more faith in than God. The thing that he loved more than God. On the surface, he kept all the commandments, right? He didn't cheat Mm -hmm. on a spouse. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't steal anything. He didn't bear false testimony. Um, So all of those acts of civil righteousness, he thought merited something in the eyes of Jesus. And in Jesus with one, one statement destroys all of that, right? So without faith, it doesn't matter how many of these civil righteous things that you do that uh, you you still have poor standing before God because it's not about us. Uh, It's not about what we do. Um, Then he's going to transition here uh, in 72 and following. Uh, He's going to transition a little bit uh, and he's going to bring in language that we've seen before. So he says... For human hearts without the Holy Ghost are without the fear of God, without trust toward God. They do not believe that they are heard, forgiven, helped, and preserved by God. Where have we heard that type of language before already? Do you remember? This language, uh, I'll, I'll give you the full language I'm looking for. Well, without fear of God, without trust in God, and with concupiscence. We, we said that that word, and he actually, Melanchthon uses this up in 70, yeah, paragraph 70, um, uses the term concupiscence. This is back in the second article of the Augsburg Confession, the definition of original sin. Original sin is without fear, without trust, and with concupiscence. So origin, that definition of original sin, Melanchthon brings that language back in here, to say that because of original sin, the will is not free, it's bound. It's bound in sinfulness apart from the Holy Ghost, apart from faith. Um, And so then he kind of sums this up by saying that uh, we do not ascribe, this is in 73, Doug, uh, we do not ascribe to free will these matters, namely to truly fear God, to truly believe God, Truly to be confident and hold that God regards us, hears us, and forgives us. These are the true works of the first table. So what Melanchthon is saying, but he's saying it in kind of a roundabout way, is that human free will unaided by God cannot overcome original sin. So because human will cannot overcome original sin on its own, then salvation... And remember, we talked it before when we were talking about the atonement, that any view of, of God's plan of salvation, especially when we get into how Jesus accomplishes salvation, Jesus, as, as the atoning sacrifice, must overcome all effects of sin and the causes of sin. Uh, so he has to overcome original sin. Uh, so because the free will can't, unaided by God, it has to be Christ and Christ alone. So that... Melanchthon's kind of playing chess here, and he's boxing in the arguments, and here's where he kind of drops, you know, drops the trump card, that that we can't do anything in regards to the first table, and remember the first table and the Ten Commandments, first, second, third commandment, all dealing with that vertical relationship between us and God, Um, and so we can't accomplish anything in regards to the first table. Uh, We can't, um, we, we can't, Fear, love, and trust in God above all things, the first commandment. We can't, um, uh, we can't prevent ourselves from taking the Lord's name in vain, and we can't honor and remember the Sabbath day um, without God's help because our original sin gets in the way. Um, finally, the last thing I would like to cover on this article. Any questions on that at all? No, I just I thought it was... In 74, it was good that he said even the saints find keeping this faith difficult, yeah. which, is not, which is not possible in unbelievers. Yeah, and so this is really neat, right? Because he, um, 
and I was surprised that he didn't uh, that he didn't actually cite it here. But uh, to to work out your faith in fear and trembling. So a lot of people, at, at least uh, in the Roman Catholic opponents side, will say that that deals with assurance of salvation. You can never be sure. So you're constantly in fear and trouble. That's not the Lutheran take of this. The Lutheran take is is this exact thing, right? That 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 um, you the fear and trembling is this desire to do what God wants us to do because He's worked this faith in us, and and yet we can't do it, right? Saint Paul, the good that I want to do, I don't do, and the evil that I don't want to do, this I keep doing over and over again, right? That's the fear and trembling of the Christian. It's not. It's not assurance, dealing with assurance of salvation because God is trustworthy. We can always take him at his word. And he tells us that we are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ. So we, we know that's taken care of, but we want to reflect that forgiveness. And as a, uh, someone's faith goes from being an immature faith to being a more mature faith, uh, wanting to reflect that forgiveness, wanting to reflect that that. Uh, um, the example, or right, this is the, the right way to think of Jesus as an example, um, in the sanctified Christian life. That's where we, de we desire. We desire to follow God's commands because we know that he knows what's best for us and his will is good and perfect and we should will the things that he wills. So I, I think all of that comes together right here in this paragraph. The last thing I wanted to cover uh, was actually uh, 75 into 76 right here at the end. And Melanchthon writes, and yet a distinction is shown between human and spiritual righteousness, between philosophical doctrine and the doctrine of the Holy Ghost. And it can be understood for what there is need of the Holy Ghost. So this has to deal with, with the language of philosophy being able to talk about human beings, this life. Philosophy can't talk about God because God can't be understood in philosophical terms. Philosoph philosophy is self-reflective. It uh, is a very, um, you know, uh, human being centered uh, way of looking at things. And the questions that it deals with are human being centered. This is why Luther will say that, that theology and philosophy have to speak different languages because the object of what they're trying to talk about are different. Um, now, there can be overlap um, and uh, Melanchthon is a Lutheran scholastic, just as Chemnitz will be and John Gerhard will be. And then there'll be those, those guys, uh, Chemnitz and uh, Gerhard will kick off kind of an era of Lutheran scholasticism and um, what we usually call the period of dead orthodoxy in, in Lutheranism. Um, so there's, there's a, a desire to, to be able to study these things. And yet philosophy must always serve theology uh, in the fact that when we when we transition to talking about things of God philosophy that's not its subject matter it can't get us all the way there we need right. theology and this is where Luther will talk about that theology has its own language that we use philosophical terms but we use them very differently uh, because we're describing uh, something very differently all right any any questions uh, on this one so we're making nope. good progress tonight all right, Article 19 of the Cause of Sin. So uh, Melanchthon, here's another one that's not contested. Um, Melanchthon writes, The 19th article the adversaries can uh, receive, in which we confess that although God only and alone has framed all nature and preserves all things which exist, yet he is not the cause of sin, but the cause of sin is the will in the devil and the will uh, in men turning itself away from God. You can see this, it doesn't translate very well into the English, but in the, the Latin, it's much better. Um, this uh, sit voluntas uh, can govern, that, that verb can govern both devil and human beings. So it's the will of the devil and the will of the human beings. Uh, Chemnitz is going to echo this um, when he writes his two natures on Christ. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, causes of sin. Um, not only in the two natures in Christ, but when he writes his, uh, uh, his Loki, he is going to show that the cause, the, the cause of sin, and he'll go through all of Aristotle's four causes, but boiling these things down to their essence without having to get into all of that philosophical jargon, 
um, he's going to say that the true causes of sin are the will of the devil and the will of, of mankind. Um, and so that's, that's what that article deals with. Any questions on the causes of sin? No. So, so at seminary, do they, do they cover Aristotle's writings and show how these yeah, things it depends. Up? It depends on what professor that you get, uh, how well they cover these things. Um, some uh, tend to, and, and I can understand why not introduce this type of terminology, um, because if you can, if you can't, if you can't stop there and dig into it so that there's a good understanding, um, uh, it can be difficult and people can misuse uh, Aristotelian causality to uh, and it can get you in trouble. Um, I uh, I had professors that gave me just enough to where because of my interest in it, I was able to go and, and do my own digging. Um, okay. uh, let me grab a book and I'll show you if you're, if you're interested in, in to the beginnings of these things of philosophy, there's a good intro book that one of my uh, professors recommended. Uh, I just got to grab it. All right, so I've got two of them that I've run across. Uh, the first one is called uh, An Introduction to Philosophy, Life's Ultimate Questions. Uh, it's by a guy okay. named Ronald Nash. Ronald Nash. Okay. There you go. Got Ronald it. Nash. Okay. Uh, and then this gives kind of an overview of a lot of different types of philosophy. Um, it's going to cover... Um, uh, it's going to cover... Um, Plato, uh, it's going to cover a little bit of Aristotle. It doesn't get into Plotinus, which is unfortunate, um, but it does get into Augustine. So indirectly, it gets into Plotinus because Plotinus influenced Augustine. Uh, but another one, if you're if you're interested, is uh, is called the Ideas of Human Nature. Uh, also a really good one by a guy named Roger Trigg. Uh, this will have small little excerpts, um, but a very good historical introduction of just a wide swath of, of philosophy. Uh, it is good to have those backgrounds because uh, philosophy has throughout history and continues through our times today to influence um, theology. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean influence theology in a way that it drives what theology seeks to do, uh, but it tries to answer theological questions a lot of time by separating itself from God. And because of okay. that, theology almost always has to interact with philosophy. So to understand a lot of these things, you you you, you do need a little bit of that background. Um, yeah. And, and it's also helpful because we still see traces of these things even today. Um, you know, you, you see those, the, the, the Christians that think that they're going to die and become angels. Well, that's platonic. That's a uh, you know this this uh, the shedding of the material body uh, so that they can become immaterial spirit. Um, that's not right. Uh, the body was important enough that Jesus assumed a human body. Um, that he rose from the dead with a human body, right? That he had Saint Thomas actually stick his hands, proving that it was a material body. He ascended yeah. into heaven with that material body. So. Uh, but it, when you when you hear Christians say that and you know Plato, uh, Platonic dualism, then you can go, yeah, that's that's remnants of influence of Plato that says that the immaterial good, material bad. Um, mm, yeah. And so all of those things are are really interesting, and if you know the the philosophical background, then then you can you can actually engage them because you can use you can use the theology to to answer the questions where where philosophy can only partially answer so you can yeah. fill in the rest of it and actually make it right uh in accordance with god's revealed word which is always good yeah yeah okay um let me see here let me see how long good works goes this might be good for tonight uh because i won't be able yeah, to finish good works I, I only read up through article 19 perfect well then i picked the yeah. right spot to stop for you yeah. <laughs> All right. Are you, well, are you, um, go ahead. Are you familiar? Are you familiar with the novel Sophie's World? 
I am not. It's by Justine Garter. Um, it's basically a novel about the history of philosophy. So it's okay. it's like taking a survey course in philosophy yeah. chronologically. Sure. But it's kind of couched in this little mystery of this this young teenage girl named Sophie who finds mysterious letters in her mailbox asking, um, you know, who are you? Where do we come from? Why are we here? You know, right. all the questions and whatnot. But uh, that's uh, it's it's not theological <laughs> at all. But yeah, uh, yeah, they do broach a lot of those major philosophical philosophical. Um, ideas yeah. and they do talk about Plato and his idea of forms a little bit. And, Another thing so. that if, if you're interested in this, I would commend to you is the podcast philosophy without gaps. Um, oh. And it, it traces kind of wave tops through all of these major figures. Um, I listen to it all the time. Um, and when I get done and caught up, I go back to the beginning because I've, you know, by the time you've, you've gotten through, you know, 4,000 years of history, <laughs> Yeah. You've forgotten uh, who the My Milesians were and what they came to came to do. Um, one of the things that was very fortunate kind of in my development uh, was my I think it was my first semester at Marquette. I TA'd for a professor um, and his method for teaching the intro to theology class was to to take this question, what is man? And to trace it philosophically and to talk about what the, the individual philosophical schools, what they brought to this discussion, where they fell short, and then ultimately to show how Christianity answers where they where they stop. Um, and it was a really neat way to do it. I learned uh, an awful lot in the class uh, from from this professor. Um, and uh, certainly uh, when I get to teach these things, if I get to teach these things on, on my own, um, I, I even now incorporate some of it, but certainly uh, I'd incorporate quite a bit then uh, also. It's really, really interesting to see how the two consistently interact with one another throughout history. Yeah. All right. Shall we close with the Lord's Prayer? Yep. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Um, next week, probably no class. This is finals week and I'm going to be hard pressed uh, getting everything graded and final grades finalized and, and turned in. So we'll, we'll, we'll wait. Um, Maybe not next week. If I get things done early, maybe we'll flip it to a Thursday. We'll see. Okay. But it'll a lot of it will depend on on what I got going on. <laughs> yes. All right. We'll see you next week. All right. Thanks very much. Yep. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.